Welcome to To The Point. The conversation this week in Michigan was dominated by COVID. Alarming numbers in both cases and test positivity have hospitals, public health officials, and politicians worried. Governor Whitmer, in addition to trying to convince people to wear masks, wash hands, and socially distance, was also dealing with the news that at least two high-ranking administration members had ignored the warnings about travel over spring break and headed south to the coast. That revelation came up after our interview, but here is how she responded when asked about it during a news conference. Well, I think first and foremost, let me say this. Um, I'm not going to get distracted by partisan hit jobs on my, my team. There have never been travel restrictions in Michigan. There just haven't been. What we have done is to ask people to be smart, to get vaccinated, to mask up, that is the key to traveling with confidence that you're going to be safe and not expose yourself or your loved ones to COVID or your community to COVID. So what directors do on their personal time is their business. Um, so long as they are safe, which is what we're asking everyone in the state to do, get vaccinated, mask up. If we all want the freedom to do these things that we're longing to do, that is the key to doing it with confidence that we're going to be safe and we're not going to expose anyone else to COVID. So, Go get your vaccine is my, my strongest response uh, to everyone who's watching. That's the crucial component to us getting through this moment. And that's, what, um, that's exactly what we are promoting within state government and across the state. When the governor and I spoke, the focus was very much about vaccines, the surge in cases in the state, and why she thinks imposing more restrictions, as the CDC suggested, isn't the right thing to do now. We talked just as the news of the pause of Johnson & Johnson vaccine was being announced. And I began by asking her what that leaves the state when it comes to getting more shots into arms. Well, first and foremost, let me say safety first, right? We are going to follow the FDA and the CDC guidance when it comes to the J&J &J vaccine. I think it's really important to recognize that what I, the information that I have seen on what is happening as they've had you know, six or seven cases nationally in a vaccine that's been deployed 6.8 million times. Um, I think that's an important perspective. And if those numbers hold, I think we should still have high confidence in the safety and efficacy of the J&J &J vaccine. It is an important added tool in our arsenal to combat COVID. So um, this is concerning. And of course, I'm going to continue to push for more vaccines to come into Michigan. But at this point, I don't know that there's a whole lot more we can say other than we're going to closely uh, monitor and follow the CDC and FDA guidance. On the push to get more vaccine into the state, the CDC seemed to say that the best thing to do in Michigan was pause, that it would take too long to vaccinate our way out of this surge. And I know that you made the request to the White House. Uh, it was denied. D is it your perspective that we have a shortage of vaccine or that we just need more vaccine because of this current surge that we're seeing? Well, I'm making the case that the nation should be surging vaccines to places that are hot spots, and that would be Michigan right now. We can't just move vaccines from one part of our state to where it's needed because it's needed all across the state. And so that's the case that I've been making to the Biden administration. Now, they're in a tough, they're in a tough place because, of course, they've got to manage these vaccines nationally. And I will be the first to say they've done a really good job since taking office of securing the vaccines and deploying them. I just believe that uh, they should look at where the hotspots are and really prioritize additional vaccines going to those places. We're having ongoing conversations. They have stepped up and given us more boots on the ground, more therapeutics, more mobile units. So we're grateful for that. Um, but of course, my job as governor of Michigan is to continue to fight for, for more help for our state. And that's what I'm going to keep doing. But I also need to recognize it's on every one of us to do our part. These high COVID numbers can be squashed if we all take it seriously and do our part. And that means masking up. That means making your vaccination appointment. There's lots of places on the west side of the state to do it. Of course, I've spent some time over at DeVos Place where uh, we've got an incredible partnership happening between the hospital system and the county health department and the city. And I mean, it's really um, something that is a, a great tool, but it's only a tool if everyone avails themselves of it. So please get your vaccine. 
please be smart. Um, don't do indoor dining right now. Go to your restaurant, eat outside, or pick it up and go to a park. Uh, let's get these numbers down and let's get through this together. The quicker we do that, the stronger our economy will be too. Last Friday, you made the suggestion that schools should pause for two weeks, that youth sports should pause. Uh, and again, you talked about indoor dining. I, I don't have <laughs> solid numbers, but anecdotally, uh, we know that many sports are still continuing. We know that many schools are still going in person. Don't know about the numbers on restaurants. Was it your anticipation that more schools, more of these uh, youth uh, sports groups would take your suggestion, your recommendation, uh, more seriously than they have? Well, my philosophy is that it's really important that government is watching the science and takes action where we don't have the tools to act ourselves. That certainly was the case a year ago when this virus first came to Michigan. It certainly was the case even in this fall when we had yet to even have vaccines. We took action. We crushed those numbers and we did it through executive order and, and people by and large did their part. We're 14 months into this. People are tired and they're dropping their guard and it's understandable. I'm tired too. And yet this virus is not done with us. And so we've all got to double down on those protocols. We know what to do now. That's the biggest difference. We know wearing a mask, avoiding indoor gatherings, washing our hands, um, and getting that vaccine are the things that each of us can do to help our state get through this. And we're strongly encouraging everyone to do their part. Uh, we can't continue on with um, the, the way that things are where we have just seen this community spread. It's a problem for every one of us. And that's why every one of us has to be a part of the solution. Posi uh, the positivity rates are five times as high as uh, health officials would like to see them. The CDC said that Michigan, or it sounded to me as though she suggested that Michigan should shut down for a couple of weeks. I heard you say uh, on Monday that we're in a different moment, that you didn't necessarily want to go in that direction again. But are you considering uh, looking uh, to the health department for some type of a, uh, a rule that might suggest a, a larger pause in the state? Well, listen, you know, the CDC, um, you know, they got a big job. They got to look at all across the country. They're not here on the ground in Michigan. They don't know what we are really confronting with regard to the appetite of the public, with regard to the legislature's, um, you know, resistance to a lot of these measures, with regard to what the realm of tools that are at my disposal are at this juncture in fighting the virus. Uh, a lot of things are, are, are changing and are fluid here, and that's why uh, I, I don't think that the counsel that they've given um, really is reflective of the realities that we're confronting and the possibility of, of really ensuring compliance here. We've all got to do our part. And that's the stage that we are in in this, in this virus. We know what works. We're calling on everyone to take this seriously, to stay safe, to protect yourselves and um, help us get through this tough moment. We were, did a really good job for a long time here in Michigan. We kept our numbers at or below 3% for a long period of time. 14 months in, we're tired. And that lack of following the protocols coupled with big reservoirs of people in our state that don't have antibodies because we kept our numbers down. You add variants to the mix, which we have a lot of variants in Michigan, and that's precisely why we're seeing such growth in our positivity numbers. Now, the good news is it's not as severe as what we saw in the past. The numbers might be as high, but what is happening in terms of when people present into our hospital systems, they're younger, uh, they're not going on ventilators the way that we were beforehand. It's, I'm not minimizing it because our hospitals and our hospital staff are stressed out but it's a, it's a different moment, and that's why it's really crucial that everyone takes this seriously and does their part. You said something just a moment ago that I heard you mention in a national interview recently, and that is that perhaps because we stayed so locked down for so long, we didn't develop the antibodies or the herd immunity that we might have otherwise. In reflection, did we stay locked down too long, or is there any way to know? Well, first, you know, I don't think lockdown is the right word, right? We had a stay home order for, you know, a short period of time at the beginning of COVID. We've had protocols that were some of the strongest in the nations for a long time. Because of that, we saved a lot of lives and we bought time. We bought time to get to vaccines. We bought time to get to more testing. We bought time to get to PPE. The trajectory we were on, if we had just let it go, we would have lost thousands and thousands more people to this virus. And we would have 
not just to the virus, but to other ailments because our hospital systems would have collapsed. We bought time, and that has been good time, actually, because now we have vaccines on the market that are accessible for people. We now know that um, the vast majority of people who are over 65 are inoculated, and we're not seeing them in the hospitals. And that's why uh, the protocols that we had for a long period of time were really important. We never got to herd immunity. That's when you get to 70% of our population, and that's no state has gotten there yet. And that's why vaccines are so important to get us there so we can resume that normal normalcy we all crave. And our goal is to make sure we do it by 4th of July. There is so much to talk about. I, I got to get this last question in, and that's about uh, a large number of dollars that will be flowing to the state of Michigan. Uh, we, you and I had a conversation about this. We'll have other conversations about this because this will be 14 billion, 18 billion, depending on how it all works out. Some of it's going to go to local communities. Some of it's going to go to the state. You've got some very specific things you'd like to do with that. We know the legislature is going to have to weigh in. I'm not going to go through all of the hurdles that that may create. But tell me from your perspective what you would like to see those dollars spent on in this really once in a probably generation opportunity to get that kind of an influx. Exactly. That's what we've been talking about, Rick. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to actually take these resources and make transformational change investments. And that's got to be our mindset. We cannot let politics keep us from finding common ground on the fundamentals. And that is things like, you know, the education and care of our children. Those are things like um, upskilling our population, creating opportunities for people to enhance their skills. Because we know in a recession, the most recession proof thing you can have is a skill and to get into good paying jobs. Um, infrastructure is a critical component and of course, uh, creating better access to healthcare. These are all responses to COVID and the crisis that we've confronted as a globe, but this is also an opportunity for us to make those long-term investments and really do some things that'll transform our state, not just in response to COVID, but to set us on a path of success for a time to come. None of this should be inherently partisan and that's why I have really gone above and beyond to make sure that we're setting a table that is one that I'm hoping the legislature will join me at. Um, I didn't articulate how every penny should be spent, which is usually what a governor would do and send it to the legislature and make them counter or react to that. I'd like to build this together. And that's why we're taking the tack of setting forth our values and what we think the big buckets are for our economic resurgence and uh, opening the conversation. And we're really eager to get it going. Governor, as always, we appreciate your time. Thank you. The governor also said this past week regarding the surging cases of COVID-19, quote, we're in a tough spot, Michigan, end quote. But she said we can beat the virus by following safety protocols and getting vaccinated. When we come back, a freshman member of the U.S. House has his first floor speech and challenges the way our country's armed forces might be put into action. That's next. To the point. Welcome back to To The Point. Congressman Peter Meyer has only been in office about three and a half months, but it has been an extraordinary time to be in the nation's capital. We talk with him about that time and some of what he is focused on as he settles into his new position. Congressman, there's so much to talk about. I originally reached out because I wanted to talk to you about something that I think people don't really understand a lot, and that's the authorization, authorization to use military force. It's something that comes up from time to time. Congress is supposed to have input into that, but there are some really open-ended engagements out there. We're going to talk about one of those again in just a little bit, but talk to me about your efforts when it comes to these so-called AUMFs. Yeah, well, thank you, Rick. So, you know, you mentioned input. You know, Congress retains the war authorizing capabilities in Article I of our Constitution. And in the all too often, the, the commander in chief in Article II, the president, has, has really run roughshod over that constitutional responsibility. And Congress has not done much to assert its prerogative in this area. So, in order for us to go to either declare war or to authorize hostilities, we need to pass what's called an authorization for the use of military force. Uh, we had the 2001 AUMF authorization that um, presaged our activities in Afghanistan and the broader global war on terror, the 2002 AUMF, which was our authorization to deploy forces into Iraq in 2003. And then we've had prior ones as well, some of which are still on the books, the 1991 AUMF for the Gulf War, that's still active and open, and the 1957 AUMF that President Eisenhower had to go and, and check communist influence in the Middle East. So I'm part of a bipartisan group that's seeking to reform and modernize these efforts, starting with the repeal of the 2002 
1991 and the 1957 AUMFs, and then looking at strong reforms of the 2001 AUMF, which has been stretched beyond its original intent. That would include the activities in Afghanistan that this week the president said will come to an end on the 20th anniversary of the attacks of September 11th. You were there, both military and civilian. You know what was going on on the ground. Give us your take on the president's decision. And this kind of ties in with what you're talking about with doing away with the authorization. Yeah, so I supported the Doha agreement uh, that the Trump administration had negotiated that originally had a May 1st withdrawal date. I think it's understandable that the Biden administration wanted to reevaluate and have their time uh, since taking office to assess and have their plan. So I'm heartened to see that President Biden has chosen uh, just a few month extension of that to withdraw all remaining forces from Afghanistan. Right now, those force levels are around 2,500 troops. So it's a, a you know a small, small, small fraction of when we used to have over 100,000 American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines uh, stationed there. But we need to face reality. There's, this is not a choice between a good option and a bad option. It's between a bad option and a worse option. And we need to focus on not just prolonging the inevitable, but confronting the reality that we were successful in denying terrorist sanctuary in Afghanistan. That was our intent after 9-11. And that the other objectives that started to get piled on, whether it was counter-narcotics, whether it was counter-insurgency, whether it was nation building, uh, those were simply not something that could be accomplished through military ends. And we need to look for a negotiated political solution. And this is just that. I hate moving along so quickly, but there are so many subjects. This past week, you visited the southern border, and we now know that that has grown to a critical mass with facilities that we are seeing some indication are, are horribly uh, mm. overpacked. What did you see when you were down there? And what, if anything, can Congress do to work with the administration to try to mitigate some of what's going on there? Yeah, I serve on the Homeland Security Committee and we have oversight of uh, the Department of Homeland Security and Border Patrol uh, and the other entities that are in charge down on our border. Uh, I was stunned. Um, I had seen some of the photos, but until you you see children two, three, four years of age, you know, um, sitting in, in you know these small cages until you see just the massive amounts of folks that are coming in, um, some who have legitimate asylum cases, many who are, are arguing asylum without the credible fear requirement, um, and, and many who are just seeking a better life for their families. But we are creating this incentive for folks to come over uh, based on the messaging that's been coming from the highest levels, and that's resorted in extremely large numbers. Now, we saw a large surge in 2019. Um, but even compared to those years, we're still over 30% from those record highs and the numbers continue to go up. And that's resulted in uh, just tremendous amounts of, of narcotics coming across the border as well, because all of the human trafficking that's occurring, you don't cross the southern border illegally without paying off a cartel. Now that can be $1,000, $3,000 for a Mexican national. Uh, for other um, countries in the Northern Triangle, it can be upwards of $10,000, right? There are set amounts that are being paid. The cartels are benefiting from this. They're using that to distract our border forces so that they can put in uh, drug smuggling routes in other places. But this is, this is an ongoing humanitarian crisis and catastrophe will happen. You know, we're going to see in the spring rising waters in the Rio Grande. We're going to see higher temperatures and the possibility that folks who are, are being put on this trek because they, they think that um, they will be welcomed in and that they're, this is the pathway that they should be pursuing. Uh, they're putting themselves in risk. They're putting their families at risk. And, and we need to own up for our responsibility in this and not have the United States government essentially be the last leg of a human trafficking operation. When you think about solutions, there is whatever the immediate solution may be, but for decades, since I was on Capitol Hill, we've heard elected officials talk about the need for comprehensive immigration reform. With Congress more divided than ever, in my opinion, is that possible? I'll be honest, Rick, I don't know. Uh, my my hope of the possibility for, for bipartisan cooperation uh, when coming into office, I'm in part of the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus. My initial hope has been pretty well dashed. We've seen, um, frankly, since the Democrats retook the Senate on January 5th, We've seen just power politics and, and overplaying their hand. I know you might ask me about the uh, attempts to um, you know, do away with the filibuster and, and pack the Supreme Court and things that were considered outlandish during even the Democratic presidential primary campaign now seem to be what um, the party, the Democratic Party itself stands for. And so this, this majoritarian impulse 
to really run roughshod over norms and traditions of governance. Um, I, it, it worries me because it, it basically makes it impossible for anyone operating in good faith on either side to come to common sense understanding and, and seek bipartisan agreement. Yeah, and I do want to talk to you briefly about the Supreme Court, the notion that you would add a number of new justices to the Supreme Court, obviously not something you're in favor of, but what would that do uh, for the respect of the almost reverence that I think uh, many in this country hold towards the Supreme Court because they are the final arbiter in so many very important decisions? I mean, the last time this was floated in a serious way was during the Roosevelt administration, and it nearly caused a constitutional crisis. And, and even Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in the height of of the New Deal and his his commanding, um, you know, authority and role over the country during the Great Depression, you know, realized it was a step too far. Um, I, it it is astounding. Um, I it frankly it leaves me a little speechless. Um, the Democrats right now, their attempt, and we've seen this with frustration over not being able to get Republican support on legislation. I assure you, you know, you if there is good faith effort to make sure that some of the worst elements of the bills that are passed um, are, are mitigated and that it's done with a consideration for what their actual impact will be on the country, um, there are folks who will be willing to support that. But not if it's my way or the highway, take it or leave it. We're going to pass this with or without you. Um, it's going to be no wonder that there isn't broad bipart that bipartisan members are not willing uh, to sacrifice way more than the other side is willing to give up. And, and frankly, I mean, just packing the Supreme Court will be, I don't know what's worse than poisoning the well. I mean, this, this would be poisoning, you know, the entire watershed, the entire, um, the entire region. This is uh, really just an inconceivable breach and and we've seen in the past harry reed when he exercised the nuclear option in 2007 um to go from a 60 vote to a 50 vote majority in order to um, appoint uh you know lower court judges uh that came back to to haunt the democrats they came back to haunt them as well when they abolished that for um supreme court justices so I, this this is just an accelerationist politics that is not going to end well for the party pursuing it or for the country as a whole and quickly in the time that we have left, a milestone for a new congressman. You made your first floor speech this uh, past week. What was that like and, and what was uh, the message you had? Yeah, I've been very active on the committee side and trying to lay the groundwork some for some longer term legislative priorities. So I haven't focused too much on speaking on the floor, but I was proud uh, to speak in support of an effort to, um, to extend the scheduling of fentanyl analogs. So fentanyl is, is this chemical substance that's been added to, to heroin. It's made it more addictive. It's been one of the constituent causes of our increase in opioid overdoses. The latest CDC data that came out yesterday showed a 30% increase in opioid fatalities. I think 87,000 Americans died from September 2019 to September 2020 because of heroin and, and just overdoses in general. So uh, right now, the scheduling for that expires on May 6th which will make it harder for our law enforcement to really target these analogous substances that have that same impact as fentanyl. Um, and we were hoping to get that uh, on, a, on a floor vote and the Democrats shot it down, unfortunately. So what's ahead as legislators get ready for more serious budget talks in Lansing. And in Washington, is straight party line voting the new norm? We'll talk about that when we return to the point. In Lansing, legislators need to get busy on budget talks if they hope to have a budget to the governor by late spring or early summer. With the state awash in federal money and plenty of disagreement on how to use it, that may be easier said than done. In Washington, the president's Americans job plan is drawing high praise from Democrats and no takers on the Republican side. Could it be another example of straight party line vote in the Senate? And will the filibuster rule be scrapped to make that the norm? We'll be watching all of that each week right here to The Point.